Hi, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we're here to talk with Stephen from BitSight about how security ratings and continuous monitoring are revolutionizing cyber risk management. I'm Teresa Law. I lead product marketing at ServiceNow, and we're really excited to have Stephen here. He is the CTO and co-founder of BitSight. Prior to BitSight, he was the president and co-founder of Sapirix, which was acquired by Firemon. It was a company that was spun out by MIT Lincoln Laboratory. It's focused on vulnerability and network topology risk analysis. He's been busy even when he was at MIT. He led the R&D program, solving large-scale national cybersecurity problems. So he's been in the cybersecurity space for quite a while. And prior to joining MIT Lincoln Laboratory, he designed, developed, and tested products at one of the earliest Linux startup companies. So that was a while back, Caldera Systems. Yes. Really happy to have you here, Stephen. Um, and I'm really interested to see what you've got to show us about the but site and ServiceNow vendor risk management. Excellent. Well, thank you, Teresa. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and also be addressing uh, this great community. Uh, so really excited about the engagement. This is an Ask the Expert. Uh, I guess you can debate whether or not I'm an expert, uh, but happy to answer any questions uh, to the best ability I can. So I'm going to flip over uh, to some slides. Um, so let me bring those up and make sure that everybody uh, can see. Yeah, we see them. Yeah, it looks great. And I, I think I think you have the credentials to become a, to be an expert. I'm, I'm yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, really what I wanted to talk about is an area that's evolving pretty rapidly. And we're just excited about the partnership here with ServiceNow and the applications and efficiencies that that's unleashing for our customers. Uh, and so if you're a ServiceNow customer, great opportunity. And even if you're looking at that, uh, we're happy to ask questions about you know, what is it capable and the outcomes you should expect. And so uh, the topic that we're really trying to talk about is how this notion of what's called a security rating, and I'll talk about that, uh, and monitoring continuously is really transforming the way people are managing risk. Uh, and it's evolving pretty rapidly. It's really a market that uh, we pioneered back in 2011, where people said, hey, I'm really lacking an empirical continuous way to assess risk. Uh, and uh, we so we started out with the National Science Foundation and did a bunch of research there that's really yielded where we are now in a, a pretty big growing market segment uh, to where you know Gartner has said that security ratings will be just as important as credit ratings by 2022, which is actually a, you know a pretty interesting pronouncement. 2022, here we are, 2019, only three years out. Uh, yeah. So a lot of things that you know will change between now and then. Uh, but it's interesting that understanding risk and be able to quantify it in an ongoing, continuous way is something that you know we're really focused on, and obviously just delighted to be able to work with uh, ServiceNow on. So I wanted to, to set this up. Uh, if you're attending this webinar, you may be an expert, uh, you may be learning about the area, but I just wanted to share some data with you. We're a very data-driven company, uh, and just talk about some of the spend that's going on here in the cybersecurity space. What you see here on the left-hand side is a graphic that 87% of companies believe that they're going to increase their spending over the next 12 to 18 months in cybersecurity. Wow. There are a few areas of budget where 87% of companies agree that they're going to go increase spending on, uh, which is pretty interesting when you think about what you could go be spending your resources on as a business. Uh, and that's driven a lot by what's been going on in the cybersecurity landscape as people realize, hey, this is a risk that I've got to better manage and I need to invest uh, here. And so uh, if you look at those data points, you know, what you're seeing out of ESG, what you also see out of Gartner is spend even this year is going to eclipse a hundred, hundred billion dollars in cybersecurity. Uh, that, that's, that's incredible. It is. It's, it's really a massive growth. Uh, that's a lot of money spent on this particular area and it continues to grow when you think about where, you know, the expectations are by 2022, you know, somewhere around 140 billion, uh, uh, and, you know, the question is always, hey, am I spending in the right place? Am I getting the right return on my investment? Am I managing those risks? And that's something that we think a lot about and I'll talk more about uh, through the discussion. At the same time, spend, uh, organizations are trying to gain efficiencies in other parts of their business, uh, not just cybersecurity, by outsourcing or using SaaS services or different cloud services where they create a dependency on someone outside of themselves. And so you think about some of the history of businesses they built their business, they had a marketing team, they had a sales team, they had the IT teams. Uh, those were all in-house uh, and they ran them all and they, you know, some people would even do their own printing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. 
more and more people are outsourcing for very good business reasons. Uh, but what that's doing is it's creating these outside dependencies that introduce risk. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, this is a study from Deloitte uh, where, you know, they believe that 70% uh, of those that they had surveyed had somewhat moderate to high dependency on some external entity. We call that a supply chain partner. That could be a vendor. Uh, but really that is continuing to go up. And another Deloitte study is that, you know, it's up, uh, you know, 50% from last year or 50% more had increased the dependency. So that dependency is going up and for lots of good reasons. And a lot of this is the digital transformation mm -hmm. uh, with uh, introducing you know, cloud services and SaaS services, uh, adding a lot of efficiencies, uh, really transforming the way in many ways business is done. Uh, but as you put more dependencies out there, well, there are risks that are maybe outside of your direct sphere of control. And so this has been causing uh, many issues for folks and in the next slide I'm going to tell you exactly how, how that's been doing it, but it's, it's a risk area that people need to be thinking about uh, because it's a growing risk area uh, and there are key dependencies that your business depends on that you have to be able to understand, have visibility into and manage, right? So uh, I wanted to share you know, some, some additional data here around, hey, why are these risks needing to be managed and, and better controlled? Well, certainly the spend's up and the dependencies up, well, what, why? Well, uh, there's a study you know, from Cybersecurity Ventures and Cybersecurity Magazine here that estimates uh, six trillion in cybercrime by 2021. I don't know if that's the right number, but that's a big number. And even if they're five trillion off, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's still, that's still that's huge. It's still really massive when you really think about the billions and losses we already have reported, and that that's been continuing to grow. Those are serious business losses, and I think that's the that's the one of the shifts here in the market is that cybersecurity isn't just a cost center or an IT operation; it's a business risk. Uh, and uh, given to kind of what I'll talk to in the regulations in the next slide, those are things that you need to gain visibility to be able to manage. Uh, and so then going back and looking at those external dependencies, when you think about your supply chain, this was also Deloitte, who said 40%, 47% of organizations had had some sort of risk incident caused by a third party in the last three years. So think about that. One in two of these organizations have had some sort of risk incident, could have been breach, could be loss of data, some, some downtime, something causing risk to the business in the last three years. That is pretty substantial when you think about the amount of money at risk, the amount of money being suspended, the dependencies that are growing, and the risks that are coming through those dependencies. And so this is where uh, everyone is waking up to the fact, in some ways some have been earlier than others, but the market is really shifting here uh, to believe that this is something that I've got to watch. Actually, we were just out at RSA uh, last week, and what we learned is that supply chain uh, talks and talks about the risk in the supply chain was the number one topic submitted to RSA, which is pretty interesting. Five, six years ago, when we got this, getting this thing going, nobody was talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it seems to be one of the hottest areas uh, of risk management as people realize, hey, this is out of my direct sphere of control. What do I do? Uh, because it's going to have substantial business uh, impact. So businesses and organizations aren't the only ones paying attention here. Uh, I wanted to talk about the regulatory pressure. Uh, more and more regulations, uh, and depending upon which industry, and you're, you're going to see this, uh, but you see that given the, the risks and many of the actions and things that have happened over the last even few months and years, uh, boards are definitely focused on this area. And we talk with a lot of different boards. A lot of our uh, customers use us in the reporting to the board around uh, risk here. And now this is becoming a must. Uh, and when you look at different surveys, uh, really most large organizations will have some cybersecurity reporting uh, to the board and even have different risk committees around this. Uh, the boards are focused on it. That's it from a governance standpoint, you know, internal stakeholders, but regulators are absolutely focused here. And so I travel around the world and work with a variety of different uh, groups in different uh, countries. And we get to engage with uh, the regulators, many of whom you know, we work with directly, and they see third-party risk as one of the largest areas of risk. And they're adding additional scrutiny here. You know, I've given a couple of examples, one which is pretty interesting, many of which you may be tired of hearing about GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation out of Europe, principally focused on uh, privacy. However, 
uh, part of that regulation is that you are jointly responsible with your third party if data is lost. So think through this one. You share your data with the marketing firm to do a campaign. That marketing firm is compromised. You are now jointly responsible with that marketing firm for potentially up to 4% of your global revenue. Uh, for some of these large organizations, that's massive. Uh, when we talk with uh, a lot of our customers, especially in Europe, they have unlimited budgets right now to go tackle uh, GDPR because it's such a substantial risk uh, to the business. Uh, but if you are in, in utility or energy, we've been working a lot more with these uh, lately. Uh, you have NERC and FERC who are now getting much more prescriptive around looking at the supply chain. And you may not be looking at it as closely as we are, but not just maybe less than a month ago, the Wall Street Journal had a big article about uh, attacks against uh, uh, companies in the energy grid or even the supply chain partners in the energy grid. Uh, and one of my favorite quotes out of that article, uh, and we actually will share it to the community so everyone can get a reference, was this this uh, this employee of a company, I think it was a 13 person excavation company. And his his question was like, what the hell? Why do they, why do they care about me? Uh, and the response was, it's not you, it's who you know. Uh, and I think that was, you know, it was really telling, I think about uh, attackers are going after uh, your supply chain partners who may be weaker than you, um, and there are real implications for that from a security standpoint, but also from a regulatory standpoint as uh, the minimum standard of care for what you need to do here uh, is continuing to escalate as the risks do. Uh, and the regulators are watching it, uh, governments, uh, and certainly from, from the board uh, perspective. So I've kind of set this up. It's not all doom and gloom, but I wanted to talk about uh, the changing uh, environments, uh, the increasing risks, and then to talk about, you know, what the, the topic here is, you know, security ratings. Uh, and before I get into, you know, too much of, you know, what we're doing there, uh, like, well, why are why do ratings exist? Uh, and if you think about why ratings exist, uh, they typically exist for three reasons. And if you think about credit scores on consumers or Yelp ratings or anything on uh, like Amazon purchase sites, you, you're, you're rating the vendor, you're rating the product. Uh, they exist for really three reasons. One is transparency, which is, hey, I'm trying to engage in something where I don't clearly have all the facts or all the information. I can't, you know, can't always audit or can't see everything, and so I, I need some more transparency. The other one is, how do I trust this particular tr person or transaction? Uh, I mean, I know that I haven't been working with them for a while. And then the last one is really scale, which is I can over time start to build transparency and trust with somebody that takes some time. If I need to do that with millions of people, well, that's a challenge. Uh, so one of our customers, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, is TransUnion. They have data on one in seven humans on the planet. Uh, and so for them to build trust and transparency, uh, that's really hard. They really need to have approaches that scale. And so one of the ways that that's uh, evolved in that market is consumer credit ratings. You have uh, uh, consumer credit scores. You have credit ratings uh, like a Moody's, S&P, or Fitch that are looking at debt. Uh, and really, the market that we pioneered and lead today is, is called security ratings, uh, where you're looking at security performance of organizations to really solve those challenges of trust, transparency, and scale, which is now that I have dozens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of third parties uh, that I have to manage, uh, I need a better way to scale and manage, measure and manage that risk. What's also, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as well, and love to take questions on it, as organizations are global, they have bit different business divisions, they're geographically dispersed, they need to manage their own performance uh, in the area we call security performance management. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, ratings, the question is, hey, why? I'll give a little bit of background around you know, why that exists in different markets. In security, there's really a need to have a common metric or a common measurement across the enterprise, but even outside the enterprise. And so, you know, I'm bringing out here in this slide different groups that uh, need a quantitative measurement for security performance to get to a risk assessment very quickly. Think about procurement uh, when they're trying to onboard. You have three or four vendors that you're looking at. Uh, what we hear from a lot of our customers is that that procurement cycle, the time to say, hey, we we want to potentially procure a solution to the time that they can get it to operation can be months. Uh, my, many times the security assessment is the long pole in the tent. That's the one that's uh, slowing things down. And it's it's inhibiting the ability to get business value uh, from that 
partnership. And so procurement teams need a way to quickly assess, uh, do vendor selection, uh, and get to rapid onboarding. The security teams clearly have to do their assessments either from themselves, uh, reporting to different stakeholders uh, internally, enterprise risk groups, hey, what are key dependencies? How do we manage business continuity? The audit team is obviously checking and looking, do we have the right processes? One thing that's also interesting is uh, the marketing teams and sales teams want to be able to use security as a differentiator. Uh, and so we see uh, our customers uh, talking about their security rating and performance to their prospects and their customers so they can be comfortable uh, with their SaaS service uh, and differentiate themselves from their competition. Uh, the financial group, uh, they want to know, hey, are we getting a return? Are we getting better? Are we investing in the right areas? And legal certainly managing all the risks that you know, we just talked about from a regulatory uh, in a standpoint uh, and, and contractual. So when you think about trying to get a common measurement across those, this is really where uh, security ratings is targeting. And so for us, uh, where we really wanted to be able to do is give something that is a business translatable metric uh, that can be used and understood without even necessarily being a security expert. And so we uh, decided on a range of 250, 900, very similar to consumer credit scores. And so when I can tell my grandmother, hey, there's a company that may be doing 800, she knows, hey, they're pretty good. Uh, and she doesn't know necessarily anything about security, uh, but it's a way to understand and translate very, very complex cybersecurity issues and performance into a business context. And I think that is probably the key thing here across those different use cases. How do you communicate? How do you collaborate? Uh, how do you make business decisions uh, about cyber risk? And so these are very data driven. I'm going to show you here exactly how we do it. Uh, it's delivered every day you know, through a SaaS platform and it's updated continuously. And I think that's that third point that I really want to emphasize is continuous monitoring. Uh, this cybersecurity landscape, and as Teresa said, I've been doing this a long time, changes every day and we get to see it. Uh, we get to watch what's going on and it's such a dynamic landscape. It's very different than most other business risks. It cuts across every part of the business, but it's changing all of the time. And so this is something that you can't just look at once and go, you know, I'm gonna check in a couple of years and see how we're doing uh, because it can shift on you pretty rapidly. And so watching this in a continuous fashion, understanding where the risks are, where uh, there may be gaps and addressing those quickly is, is critical. So let me talk about how we calculate the ratings because I get questions about this and Hey, we'll put a type your questions in and, and we'll follow that on the community. Uh, but we really start with massive data collection. We are collecting telemetry or, or measurements uh, from around the internet every day, uh, around the whole IPv4 and IPv6 address space. We, data data we are collecting telemetry or, or measurements uh, from around the internet every day, uh, around the whole IPv4 and IPv6 address space. We data I just got an echo, so I want to make sure that. Uh, everyone else is on mute for just one I think, second. I think we're good. Okay. We'll uh, hear it. Yeah. <laughs> just got a quick So it sounds like we're, we're okay now. So we're collecting these measurements without respect to a particular organization. And we've been doing this now for eight years. So we have really eight years of history on organizational performance for the things that we measure. Uh, and so at, at this point, uh, the scale has gone to about 120 billion measurements a day, which is pretty massive. Uh, we're continuing to grow that. But these are data streams that we are hi highly curating that are either proprietary owned exclusive to us uh, or we have through pretty privileged relationships uh, that are very uh, actionable verifiable measurements of security performance and that's where i talked about qualified data there's a lot of interesting data out there that's good for threat intel uh, very few data sets that are high quality enough and reliable enough for a rating in a business context and so that's something that we spend a lot of time on and our customers are watching that every single day and we are highly scrutinized to where quality of the measurement uh, is absolutely paramount. Well, if you're just measuring and, and collecting data off the internet, well, it's not really actionable until you assign it to an organization. And this is where we spend a lot of time. We have patents in this area. We have an entire team uh, of humans also working on this. We automate this, but there are also some challenges to be able to do this, that you have humans going and verifying the quality uh, where we are now taking those measurements, assigning them to an organization saying, hey, I saw this particular behavior on this IP address. It just happens to belong to this utility or this financial institution. Uh, and then now we can start to say things about what's going on at that utility or that financial institution. 
So uh, those are the measurements. Then the question is, well, how do you weight those? So we have uh, 23 risk vectors that we're tracking, which is the broadest of, of really any offering out there uh, in the industry. Uh, and we weight them based on probability and correlation to negative outcomes. Uh, negative outcomes can be lots of different things. Uh, we also tie to, to breaches, uh, could be vulnerability, exploitation. And when we go and look at the types of things that we measure uh, and look at the outcomes that come from those measurements, uh, system compromise is the highest correlated to breach of anything that we measure. And we focus on this. We're the best in the world at finding these systems. We can determine systems that are compromised inside organizations without actually being inside those organizations. Uh, those, those machines, when, once malicious code gets on those machines, they have to beacon out. Uh, as soon as they beacon out, that traffic is observable outside of the organization. And we can track that back and say, hey, this clearly is coming from this utility or that financial institution. And now we know that they had a security gap. Uh, we don't always know what the gap was. It was a training error. It was a detection error. Uh, but we know that somehow malicious code successfully landed on those machines. And we weight that pretty highly. That's roughly 55% of our rating. Uh, but there are others in terms of looking at best practices, vulnerabilities, patching, et cetera. Uh, we track that. That's roughly 35%. And then we do look at what the users are doing. And oftentimes, users are one of the weakest links in a security program. Uh, and so we weight that. And then we also track breaches. We do state-by-state uh, -state Freedom of Information Act requests. We do more 800,000 news sites. We're looking for any public disclosure uh, of a security incident that's going to have a bearing on your risk program. Uh, now, once you have all that information, you can combine it into a comparable metric. Uh, and that's the rating, 250 to 900. That is updated and, ch and, and changed every day based on the risk context. So then you can go take action. And I'm excited to show you, you know, how that works in the ServiceNow uh, platform. So I'm going to move on from this. Typically, to get a lot of questions on this, and let's go back to that. You can type some of those into the community. I'm uh, looking forward to asking, answering those questions. So there's the technical part of it. And then I would say uh, we've learned a lot over these last years around, well, how do these things get used and what are the benefits? And so at this point, we're over 1,500 customers, you know, 25,000 users. Uh, and what that's driving is tremendous collaboration and adding capability that you couldn't get in any other way. I could monitor the entire internet. Uh, and there are certain things in visibility and context that we're only getting through participation of really the largest ratings network in the world. Uh, just in some of these statistics here, uh, just in the last year, over 4,500 invitations to join uh, and communicate and collaborate uh, on our platform went out from our customers to those who weren't our customers. Uh, about 15,000 different comments uh, and annotations on specific pieces of measurement and, and risks that have been identified by us. And then our customers have tagged over 100,000 pieces of what we call network infrastructure, which is, hey, is this my guest Wi-Fi? Or is this this particular business division or that divi division or this application, which is giving business context to the measurement. When you combine those two, you're really getting unmatched visibility and, and, and the capability to go and uh, prioritize and, and drive down risk. And so when you think about the, the benefits here, and I'm, I always talk about hey, the challenges, the solution, and really the benefits. The benefit is just better visibility and context into what's going across that supply chain and yourselves. Uh, better prioritization. Now that you have that visibility, you can focus in areas that are the real risks uh, to you, which leads to better ROI and a much more efficient, productive program. So uh, we combine that really unparalleled measurement and visibility with a community and a network that's driving the, uh, the, the efficiencies, uh, that becomes really powerful. So I'm going to share a couple of different case studies here where our customers are benefiting uh, from these. And I'll share a little bit more if we can get to them in, in the questions, but I want to leave also time uh, for the questions. So the first one I wanted to talk about is, is Barclays Bank. Uh, we jointly presented uh, this at uh, you know, some large symposiums uh, and talk, and we educate the market around, hey, how do you get measurable risk reduction and do that efficiently? So uh, the assignment to the Barclays third-party team was, hey, in the next six months, and this is coming from the board, in the next six months, we want you to measurably reduce the risk of the supply chain with these 500 critical suppliers. So think about that. And don't hire anybody. Uh, that's quite a tall ask, uh, and we worked with the Barclays team to go deliver on that, and we did, and I want to share the results here. But when you think about, hey, that is getting to scale, that's getting to quantification, real risk reduction, 
uh, very efficient. So that's really trying to solve for those different areas. And so what happened at Barclays is we work with them to engage with 500 of their supply chain partners. Once they had engaged, invited them, shared, uh, they were able to collaborate on the platform, 56% of them saw a 50 point improvement or more in their rating. I'll kind of re reiterate that. They had collaborated with them, reached out, engaged, shared the data, discussed, those supply chain partners took deliberate risk reduction actions and we could measure it uh, from a third party sample uh, without necessarily being on site. We could measure uh, the effectiveness of some of those risk reduction actions to the point that over half of them had a 50 point improvement on our scale. That is something that the Barclays team could take back to their board and say, we accomplished this. They actually did it in four months instead of six. And they showed that to their board and said, now we have measurable reduction in our supply chain with critical supply partners, and we didn't hire anybody. That's incredible. Right? And so this is where the market is shifting. And I think that's where that's why we're really excited to share this. And Barclays was you know, really delighted to you know, talk about it as well, because this is where they're starting to be able to manage this risk better, uh, to the point that now third-party supply chain risk is the number three risk at all of Barclays that gets reported. And that's, you know, that's what they're telling us, right? So uh, it's giving them the ability to say, hey, how do we get better and how do we drive a program uh, that reduces the risk for Barclays? Interesting part here, and I'll share this because this gets to the network side. Uh, this was Bob Lewis uh, at Barclays who said, hey, all this work I'm doing across my supply chain is benefiting my peers because they rely on those supply chain partners too. And the collaboration that's happening on the platform benefits all of those who participate. And so the, the work that Barclays is doing benefiting is benefiting the other 1,499 plus customers uh, on, our, on our platform because they're benefiting from that collaboration. And what he said was, hey, I'm starting to engage in systemic risk reduction, which I thought was fantastic uh, because that's we're all interconnected here when you start to look at uh, the different outsourced services. So that's Barclays. Well, we're really, really excited about that one. The next one, uh, which is a little bit of a corollary uh, to, uh, to, to the Barclays, is really scale at TransUnion. When you think about it, I talked about TransUnion and the risks that they have. Uh, clearly, we're all familiar with other uh, credit bureaus that had security challenges, and, and it's obviously TransUnion under tremendous scrutiny and pressure to deliver and to, to protect the data that they are entrusted with. Uh, and so we worked with them, and they were able to scale their program uh, by monitoring thousands of third parties, prioritizing where they're going to spend their time and determine these risk area actions. And they were able to scale that and look at nine times the number of third parties without hiring anybody. So I'll kind of reiterate on this one. Let's say they were looking, I'm going to pick a number, nine. And now they're looking at nine times nine, right? So roughly 80. Uh, and those aren't the actual numbers, but nine times the number of third parties. So when I think about that visibility, and that growing risk exposure that we really started the presentation with, the ability to expand your visibility and to do that efficiently is critical. Now, say, and then that's not just hiring an army, right? And this is where that the market has to shift is, and you saw this in other ratings market, where there's a trust, transparency, and scale. That scale piece is our ability to go and do this very efficiently. And that's really where security ratings are unleashing tremendous efficiencies is to be able to quantify and to be able to be efficient uh, and to get clear visibility for risk reduction. So those are the uh, the case studies. That's the use case. And this is where I wanted to talk about hey, how are we doing this uh, and, and unleashing these capabilities uh, in partnership uh, with ServiceNow. Uh, and so how do, you know how are we integrating that approach? And so I'll walk through just a couple of, uh, of use cases here. Uh, and then happy to follow up with the teams individually for demonstrations and you know, how that would work and integrate your environment. Uh, and we're continuing to, to develop uh, and invest here. And so here in this slide, you may recognize the, the ServiceNow portal. We've taken a portfolio, which is our customers build portfolios that they would like to monitor, cross integrate that with the portfolios of vendors in ServiceNow. And so you've linked those two together and now you've built a portfolio here uh, where you look at the provider coming from BitSight, the vendor, and there you saw that column, the, the rating that we provide from BitSight, and then an adjusted rating based on the context and information in the ServiceNow platform that you have, uh, they call the security score, which can adjust based on 
uh, different risk levels, tolerance, uh, relationship that you may have. So I wanted to just focus in here. Uh, in this case, this is Actor Films. This is a fictional company, but the uh, the data here is, is very real in integration, which is, hey, Actor Films, and the reason why I put this one in here is you may or may not have known, but Netflix had an entire season of Orange is the New Black leaked uh, because it was a post-production company uh, that was in their supply chain that was attacked, and there you go. And so if you think about this one, uh, Actors Films, uh, on the bid side scale it would have been a 500, but also given the sensitivity of the information, given the inherent risk that is maybe available in the ServiceNow platform, uh, actually drops it even lower. Uh, and so now you can say, okay, now I'm actually providing even more richness of the context, bringing together uh, the two very powerful platforms of quantitative empirical measurement uh, with the types of capabilities you get in this type of GRC uh, level platform. And now you're putting those two pieces together. Uh, and so now you can look at that, look at that or the portfolio uh, and continue to drill, follow up. Uh, and now the question is, well, how do I get even more efficiencies? And this is what I'm really excited uh, to talk about as well. Now I can trigger actions and the other things that you're probably very familiar with in the platform. But here I wanted to be able to show a rule now that you can trigger an auto assessment if the point, if the score drops by 30 points, right? 30 points may be your right tolerance, 40 points. You get to decide that, but you can build that organizationally and say, hey, given our risk tolerance, our relationship with a certain group, uh, how we're seeing things, if the if the rating drops by X percent, in this case, it's 30 points, I want to trigger an assessment. And now you're creating workflows, which is exactly what you, you want to do uh, in the platform. And so not only uh, are you being able to quantify, but now you're able to trigger and more efficiently follow up and track the workflow. Uh, this is this is where we're really excited about unleashing even more efficiencies, where we focus on the quantitative measurement. We love and uh, really prefer to integrate uh, with these uh, with the GRC solution like ServiceNow to be able to provide that workflow and bring all those different components uh, together. So I'll kind of leave for more you know, questions about that um, in the uh, in the question section. Stephen, let me make a comment real quick there because you know we were talking today a lot about Madrid, and one of the things we're talking a lot about is continuous monitoring. Yes, this is really continuous monitoring for security performance for your vendors. So this this fights this fits right in with with the theme today on continuous monitoring, and it's really really powerful because if you can keep an eye on what's happening with your vendors without actually having to sit in front of the monitor and watch all the different scores all the time. You can automate this. This is hugely powerful and extremely valuable from an efficiency standpoint. So, Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's really where the future is, right? And, yep. many, and for many organizations, it's the present. Uh, but I think more and more are continuing to grow and develop as they realize that I cannot hire enough people. They and, have to. And practically, I have I have to automate and invest in, in these sorts of capabilities. And so uh, this is the, I mean, this is where the market's continuing to go. And just like you see in these workflows, uh, and then you tailor it, right? And then you tailor it to your particular organization or your processes, uh, your risk tolerance, uh, and getting the right stakeholders involved and in understanding what the right follow-up actions are. Because speed to respond or time to remediate is the key metric in many of these cases, which is a, if, if you are a, if you are aware and you're responding quickly, you can really really limit the damage. Well, it, it, just right. imagine as your supply chain grows and the number of vendors grow, because that's that's what's actually occurring, as you mentioned earlier. I mean, it's hundreds, it's thousands yeah. of vendors that that organizations are having to deal with. How do you scale that without automation? It's just impossible, and 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 maintain a certain level of um, protection for the company. Um, yeah, and it, and it keeps going up. I tell you, some of our customers have literally hundreds of thousands. Of yes, we we do too. We've got our our vendor <laughs> risk. We've got, we've got oh, yeah. vendor so you feel it? Yes. Hundreds of thousands. Yes, right. And so you understand that. Uh, then this is the reason why credit scores and these other the, the market efficiencies, the physics of the market, uh, have to change here. And this is where bringing data and automation uh, at scale really uh, changes the game. And yeah. so uh, what I want to kind of talk about, hey, the combination here, especially when you're thinking about third parties, is a real 360 view. When you're trying to have confidence to make faster, more data-driven and strategic management decisions uh, with the limited resources. And I don't know a single organization that sits around and go, man, we just have so many resources on this. Like nobody. And we know our customers have hundreds of people doing this and they still believe that they're resource constrained. 
And so you're really adding really kind of unprecedented visibility to be able to prioritize and get to the speed at business, right? Business is moving fast. You cannot be the long pole in the tent slowing everything down. Uh, but then once you've identified risks and issues, you've got to be able to collaborate. And that's got to be something that can be measurable uh, and something that can be done very efficiently. And when you think about pulling that together with ServiceNow and the ability to put that in to track your vendors, put customized security scores around that, automate trigger workflow out of that and, and mm -hmm. document these remediation plans, that's a really powerful set of capabilities. And so here, you know, what I highlight is just the outcomes you should expect. Uh, and that's why I use those uh, case studies. That's why I wanted to highlight it here is, hey, lots of people can talk about capability and features. What I've really focused with on around the market or customer base is outcomes you should really expect. So outcomes that you should look at here are greater visibility in your supply chain, very data-driven conversations, quantification of risk reduction, uh, and then very rapid onboarding, right? Just like, hey, I'm getting onboarding, I'm getting to business fast, uh, and be able to quantify this and confidently report that and then drive other risk reduction actions, either uh, justify additional uh, budget. So I'll follow up and we can obviously ask more questions there. I did want to talk a little bit about organizations that, and then where this also is, is working to combine with ServiceNow is uh, organizations thinking about themselves and thinking about yourself uh, is what we call security performance management. Of that 112 or 20 billion spent, most of that is being spent on how do you protect yourself? Mm -hmm. and so the question is, hey, am I doing that efficiently? Am I focused on the right areas of investment? Uh, and so when we think about capabilities where organizations uh, are really the combination of them and their supply chain, you really need to be thinking about both, not just supply chain and yourself, but the whole uh, piece together around performance. And so when we think about your own organization, how do you facilitate very data-driven conversations uh, amongst key stakeholders internally, but also externally, maybe your board members or regulators? How do you compare and see how you're doing against your peer set? Uh, why might you be underperforming? And you want to be able to do that against large, large scale, not just of a, a you know two or three, but thinking about of the hundreds of companies that are roughly my size or revenue, uh, how do I compare and where am I trailing or where am I doing better? And then how do I go and justify investment? And then once you understand where you sit, where should I go and invest and how would I forecast where I should be expected performance to be? How should I tell the board? excuse me, where should we expect our performance to be in the next 6, 12, 18 months, given the budgets that you've given us? We do this in every part of our business. Uh, we really need to be doing that in security uh, and cybersecurity risk management. And so the combination here with the modules and service now around vulnerability response, and performance analytics, and conf configuration compliance, and threat intelligence, pulling those together to where now you have very efficient security programs. You're able to effectively allocate your, your resources and prioritize and continuously monitor and report, right? I think those are really key areas uh, that as the market continues to evolve, uh, pulling together these types of capabilities is going to be absolutely critical. So with that, I know we've got you know some questions. Uh, this is uh, my colleague Hanan who, who drives our relationship with ServiceNow. Of course, Teresa on the line. Uh, I wanted to be able to flip over and go to some of the questions that are already in the community. Looks like we got some good questions. So this is uh, this is great. Uh, let me see, Teresa. Do we have some that uh, you wanted me to tackle right up front? I'm starting to look at these. Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking um, maybe where do you see the biggest benefit from BitSight with ServiceNow? I mean, we just talked about that, and and we know um, we know that efficiencies are you know, scaling efficiencies are a huge thing. Vendor risk management allows you to do that. Um, by combining that with BitSight, you're not only scaling your ability to to do assessments and, and better protect yourself, but you're also getting better insight. Is there anything else that you wanted to to elaborate? Yeah, uh, so it's, it's actually great. Uh, the more we go around, it, clearly ServiceNow is doing well in the market because we see them many, many of our customers. Just like my meeting right before here, I was talking about one of our large customers as we integrate you know, with ServiceNow. Uh, Any time that you can get leverage in an investment, uh, meaning investments that already been made in BitSide, investments already made in ServiceNow, and you can get additional efficiencies and capabilities, why wouldn't you, right? Uh, as far as I know, and pretty certain, there's no charge for this, right? It's a, hey, you've already made those investments. Why not pull those out and get greater return? Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, there's a poor integration, I'll say. <laughs> I think, yeah. Yeah, clearly those are services that, uh, you know, that uh, people value and pay for, but the integration here is, hey, you've already made those investments. Uh, why don't you get the, the additional value out of that? And so I think the return here, and I, what I get really excited about is, how do we just help organizations be much more efficient uh, and effective with the investments they're making and then help them understand where they should best allocate their next investment. And that's investment of time. That could be investment of capital. Uh, could be lots of things. But I think as the market evolves, organizations will demand this type of ability. They're going to say, okay, well, are we getting better? How are we getting better? When, when are we going to get better? Uh, and not just our own internal organization, but our entire supply chain. Yeah, yeah I, th I, think, I think there's a huge appetite for more metrics. People, you know, not only from a... a security or protection standpoint, but just from a, a business standpoint, you want to be able to make informed decisions. Um, to do that, you really need to have hard data. And a lot of times I can tell you, you know, it, it's hard to get that information. So any any data points you can get are hugely valuable. So being able to have the bit site security ratings um, yeah. is another data point. I think is, the other part is, uh, which is so important, the having data, but then also to be able to compare. Yes. Um, and uh, right. context. Really context is king. You got it, right? And so, hey, you say, hey, we're all doing super well. And then you realize, well, everyone else is doing super, super, super right. well, right? So you're right. like, anyway, we're not as good as we thought, right? right. And so you want something that's you know quantitative uh, and continuous, but also comparable, right? And I think those are uh, really when we think about the value there is, okay, now I have metrics. How do I compare them against a, an industry set or my peers or uh, any other group that maybe is aspirational to be, now I can set some reasonable targets and, and focus right. on it. Yeah, the context is huge, which actually leads us into the next question here, which is what are the most important measurements of cyber risk you typically see? Yeah, so I, I talked about some of these, and so I won't go too much more into the machine compromise, but when we cross-check uh, against companies that have been breached, uh, there is no single stronger measurement uh, than the amount of system compromise we see on that network. Now, we're always very careful to say, hey, we don't always know that the measurements that we saw were directly related to that particular breach. But what we do know is that there is some loss of confidentiality and integrity on that system due to malicious code being on those machines. And then you think about, well, the longer they're there, the more frequent that happens, the severity of those particular compromises really have an impact. Uh, and so that's a big part of uh, our measurement. The other ones that are, we have, we have, 23, so I won't go through all of them. The other one that we are tracking and added is really what we call patching and, and desktop and mobile, where we are tracking the uh, the patch levels on desktop systems. So this isn't just uh, scanning the internet. This is what's going on inside these corporations that are connecting out, and that telemetry is visible. Uh, and so you can say, hey, I know that they still have a Windows XP machine in there running Internet Explorer 8. Uh, and when we cross-check that, and we have some, uh, we'll post this also to the community research uh, against breaches, we see that if you have out-of-date operating systems and browsers, your probability of breach doubles or triples, uh, right? And so these are very quantitative measurements. Uh, and even though those rates are low, this spread there is pretty substantial. And so I, you know, I, I say this probably in every webinar I do, uh, but different organizations who execute at different levels get very different results. And we can measure it. That's really where you see that. And so if you can measure it, then you can go manage it uh, and you can prioritize against it. And so when you think about compromised systems, numbers of vulnerabilities, and the types of things that users are doing are measurements that are very actionable. And so where we focus is on actionability, verifiability, so then you can go and prioritize. We're continuing to add. Uh, we've added a lot of key capability in mobile as uh, that is really the new website and a huge attack service as we look more and more and see data out there about malicious code uh, attacking mobile applications and mobile systems. Uh, it makes sense. That's where the data is. There's a lot of sensitive information when you think about what you carry around with you in your mobile device. Uh, and the attackers know that and they're using that uh, to also steal information and, and move throughout the enterprise. And many organizations that we talk to struggle with that. They, they, hey, they may have their desktop systems in order, uh, but they struggle with mobile uh, and so we see that as a huge area and a very, very strong signal uh, that we continue to add to the platform. 
Yeah, and it's really a push and pull because I mean everybody wants mobile capabilities. Everyone's all, want, everyone wants all the applications in a mobile format because it's easy and that's the way we work, you know. So, yeah. so you want that, but then you have to weigh the risk, and you need to put some sort of controls in place. And it's interesting you mentioned patching because it's it's not the vendor risk product, but it's the GRC product. But it's one of the things we actually look at from a policy and compliance standpoint also. So yeah. having BitSight looking at that and looking at your internal organization even, not necessarily your vendors, but your internal organization and looking at your scores for that combined with what GRC policy and compliance is doing for you, again, is another way to triangulate and really find those problems fast because you're right. It's those vulnerabilities that are laying in your system that you're not even aware of that are your biggest threat because attackers are smart and they're gonna find them. Um, so. So absolutely, I mean, not just externally, but also internally. And you kind of touched on this next question as we were talking about, um, you know, patching and mobile, but but um, someone asked here, what are the biggest challenges customers are addressing with BitSight? Is there anything else beyond what you just talked about? So I think there are some organizational challenges. Uh, so clearly the ones I've articulated, which is a hey, huge scale, uh, not enough staff. Uh, those are, you know, how do I quantify? But also, uh, just being able to reorient your program uh, to think about, uh, hey, where are the gaps and how do we best enable the business? One uh, one case study that I didn't share, I'll share now because I think it's probably more relevant, which is one of our customers had an 85-day process to onboard a new vendor. Wow. Um, and when you think about that, okay, that's three months. But what they heard from the business is they didn't even want to use a vendor beyond three months, right? They want to use them quick and then they were done. But they didn't even need them anymore after the, after they had done all the security assessment. And so uh, the, the business came to them and said, like, you are slowing down our ability to go do business. We understand why you're doing what you're doing because you're helping us manage risk. But we need to figure out a better way to do this. And so the challenge was, well, how do I do this in a better way and still manage the risk for the organization? And so this is a large uh, financial. Uh, and they took an 85-day process down to one wow. uh, because they said, okay, we're going to risk adjust this. We're going to say, well, if you're connecting to my network, it's a little bit different. Uh, but if you're not, well, I can, I can risk accept that a little more. If, if I'm not sharing data with you, well, then I can risk accept that a little more. And then if your bit site rating is above a threshold that the security team believes acceptable, we're going to move fast. Uh, and so you know, when they explained how they took the 85 day process down to one, they say, hey, this is how we did it. And they just took a very risk uh, based approach. Uh, and they're able to scale. Uh, and so then they're able to meet the, the challenges of the business. And I think that's really where we see that risk management has to meet up with the needs of the business. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you're not doing security assessments just to do them. You're doing that to help enable business. And so some of those challenges will be changing the way your organization thinks about certain processes. Uh, really yeah. challenging the, the current processes that are in place uh, but and thinking about it in a very data-driven data uh, and really risk-adjusted framework, which is kind of what we're seeing uh, you know, from our customers. Yeah, that's incredible, taking it down to one day. I mean, and, and it, it kind of aligns with what we're seeing with vendor risk management too. Everyone's got the same, it's the same basic comments. You know, our, our onboarding processes is taking too long. Risk assessments are, are taking too long. I'm not getting good quality information back from my vendors. We actually use vendor risk management internally at ServiceNow, and we've we've reduced the amount of time it takes to get the assessments back by 67%. Nice. So Congrats. You know, Congratulations. it's not one day. Yeah. <laughs> right, we'll, get there. we'll get you there. <laughs> it's not one day, yeah. but it is, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I, you know, I got another question for you, but I want to remind people here that the BitSight application is on the ServiceNow store now. And so you guys can go out and get it. It's, um, it's free, right? Yes. Um, so please, you know, take a look out on the store. Um, but I want to ask you, let me see here. It was a good one I saw. There's a lot of questions here. Um, what other kinds of integrations do you typically see with BitSight and Security Score and ServiceNow? Uh, so, um, so obviously the one here you're seeing now with is a you know, platform, a GRC platform, very common to pull uh, these together. Uh, we're also seeing integrations with uh, you know, security platforms like a SIM. Uh, and so when you think about organizations saying, hey, 
I see measurements that have some bearing on a security gap or security weakness. I want to go address that and track that and alert on that. Uh, and so uh, that's a, a pretty common one. But we've actually done others where people are integrating for insurance uh, and underwriting. Uh, they're integrating for mergers and acquisitions. They're fitting into a, a process there. Uh, also, even in trading, uh, we, we released a product last year called Cyber Signals, where people and hedge funds are trading on this information around security performance as they're fitting in to these different areas. The other one that I would say, I just got back from Israel, uh, work, what, the kind of what work we're doing out there uh, with the government and talking about monitoring critical infrastructure and, and countries trying to understand, hey, what are the risks uh, going on uh, in these countries? How do you measure that? How do you follow up? And from a government policy and, and risk management perspective, how do they uh, focus on that. And so getting integrated into these different processes and use cases is something that people have said, okay, now that we have a way to scale this and get an empirical measurement, you know, where else can we use it? And so we're always impressed uh, with where else these uh, pieces fit in. Also in procurement systems, um, and clearly, you know, we're really excited about the different integrations here with ServiceNow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a lot of opportunity there. We get, we get a lot of the same kind of questions. Um, cyber insurance, I think, is a really interesting area. Um, so we, we see a lot of that too. So it's a lot of, a lot of synergy there. Gordon actually asked the question, cause you have to have this question as the last question. And I think we're about out of time here. So yeah. this was my last question also. So Gordon kind of has this, um, idea also, but what, how do you see vendor cyber risk, um, management evolving? What's the future? This is the future, obligatory future question. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think I addressed a lot of that, which is a, it has to move at the speed of business, right? And so uh, you'll see additional scrutiny here. I think we're still early days in thinking about how to manage cybersecurity risk and even, even thinking about this for a supply chain. We engage with some of the world's largest, most sophisticated organizations who are literally doing zero right now for, for third-party risk you know, from a cybersecurity perspective. So this will become standard practice. Uh, and we see that, you know, you heard that from, you know, what I talked about from, from Gardner, uh, that will become the standard. People look back and go, wow, I don't even remember that. Can you believe those days when we didn't do this? Right. Uh, <laughs> that, that, then it just happens. Like, hey, can you imagine the when you didn't have a mobile phone with data? <laughs> yeah, can you, can you kids, like, 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 my kids today is how, how did you manage this without I don't a know how I managed without a GPS maps. I, I can't, I can't the stone remember. age. Yes. And so I think that that, this will just become minimum standard of care and really standard practice when you think about this. I think that as organizations figure out how to do it, this is going to be highly automated. Uh, and the degree of collaboration, I think, may be unprecedented uh, when you think about the collaboration that's going to need to happen at scale uh, across a vendor ecosystem. Uh, there's just not as much room for error, right? You think about, you don't need as much collaboration from accounting systems and other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but from cyber, that's changing all the time. And, you know, a new vulnerability is announced and your board may ask you, and we have, get this from our customers all the time, what's our exposure to this across our whole supply chain? And what are we going to do about it? Uh, and to be able to answer that, there's really this is really the only way, this is really the only approach to be able to do that. But it's also going to require high degrees of collaboration. And so when I see really looking into the future, much more automated, much more data-driven, and really much more mature practice around this, that are going to be integrated in a variety of different systems and way to report uh, and track inside the enterprise. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. BitSight and ServiceNow Vendor Risk Management together on the ServiceNow store. You can get the application. Stephen Boyer, CTO and co-founder of BitSight, really appreciate you taking the time to go over this with us. This is going to be on the community. We'll be able to ask questions after this. We want to engage with you guys. So anyone watching this who has a question, please feel free to get to jot it down. Someone will get back to you. And um, hope you enjoyed the broadcast. And again, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Teresa.